today we're going to talk about uh, something about policy, something about environmental governance in India with respect to solid and liquid waste management. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of environmental governance, how it started, from where it started, and uh, um, and then I'm going to talk about two cases particularly. Uh, I think few of them. Uh, said that they want to understand why policy fails in practice. So I'm going to talk about two cases particularly. One uh, is uh, National Urban Sanitation Policy, which was released, launched in 2008 by Ministry of Urban Development. And uh, as Sir said that the policies are mere prescriptions, they are just directions. And actually cities and states have to adopt particular rules and regulations to implement those policies. So I'm going to talk about how this particular policy, National Urban Sanitation Policy, uh, kind of failed at city level implementation. The second case that I'm going to talk about is uh, of environmental impact assessment notification. So this particular notification, what it did was, um, uh, it came into existence around 1970s, uh, where uh, environmental externalities of a particular development project were asked to be accounted in the overall cost of the development project. That means developers have to pay for the any environmental cost. And I'm going to talk about 2006 environmental assessment notification that makes domestic polluters like you and me also responsible for the pollution. As in they have to manage their solid waste and liquid waste within the premises of their building. So this particular case I'm going to talk about in context of Bangalore and how it kind of led to um, uh, adoption of mixed model of sewage management. So there is centralized system as we discussed yesterday and today also we're going to talk about. There is a centralized model of wastewater management where the government, uh, mostly urban local bodies or state water and sewerage boards, they are responsible for investing capital, maintaining such kind of systems. And then there is decentralized system where the private parties like you and me, commercial properties, uh, techno parks, all these institutions and domestic polluters are responsible for managing their solid waste, putting capital investment and managing, uh, maintaining an O&M cost for that. And how this model kind of uh, addressed certain issues of Bangalore city and kind of it failed in certain other aspects. Um, so I'll just give you an overview. When the environmental as a concern came into picture in five-year plans. All of you are aware of what are five-year plans, right? Planning commission, it kind of gives you a direction for the entire state based on the resources available, based on the previous year's um, um, progresses and what were the shortfalls. Planning commission gives you an overall picture and it kind of gives a direction to state and center that this is how you can proceed for next five years. So the environmental concerns actually started to or begin to reflect in five-year plan from the fourth five-year plan onwards. Okay, and uh, these connections between the development and environmental externalities were first understood with respect to cities. It was not with respect to overall environment that we have to save and we have to conserve. It was the need because they were thinking that urbanization is actually impacting water bodies. So this was in concern, in connection to the urban cities, in concern to the urban areas. So the focus was on water pollution and the recommendation was to again to appraise all the development project from the lens of environmental degradation and environmental conversation, uh, conversation, conservation. And it led to establishment of central legislation, a lot of water related legislation came into existence and we had um, a constitution of Na uh, central pollution control board, state pollution control board. So 1970s onward, uh, you, I don't know if how many of you are aware of Stockholm con uh, conference that was held in 1972. And then there was in February 1972, we had a co uh, government of India constituted a committee on National Council for Environmental Policy and Planning. These two particular events led to development of a uh, lot of uh, legislation in during following years in 1970s and in 1980s. So as I said, there is Water Act, Air Act, and then there is accounting for environmental externalities and development project, which was first understood for big dams and big irrigation projects in 1977. And then came 1993, 
um, in 1994, EIA notification came into existence where environmental clearance is required for all the projects and uh, development projects. And as, as I mentioned, the 2006 uh, EIA notification, which makes domestic polluters also part of this environmental clearance uh, process. And then we had an umbrella legislation, which is Environmental Protection Act. And most of the acts now come under this EPA Act. So this you are aware of that uh, till 1985 we didn't have any ministry at the center level. We had Department of Environment. So in 1985 only we had MOEF and under that CPCBs and SPCBs were formed which had um, kind of responsibility of data collection, policy, implementation, standard formation and policy and regulation. So these are the particular powers of pollution control boards. I'm not going to uh, go into detail. So what are the constitutional frameworks under the 42nd Amendment Act? Uh, the environment kind of became part of the directive principles of the state. Before that, uh, states were not at all concerned about environmental con conversation, conservation. And it also became part of the list of fundamental duties of citizens. That every citizen is responsible to maintaining and conserving environment. And Supreme Court, this is very important, that in case of any environmental related matter, any citizen can directly go to Supreme Court and High Court and directly file public uh, interest litigations, PILs. Policy framework, we have a national environmental policy which first came in 1996 and with respect to sanitation, we have national urban sanitation policy. Uh, role of judiciary has been very important, very crucial in India. Uh, so these are the doctrines that have been evolved by courts in India, uh, like public trust doctrine, which was in case uh, in 1996 where um, the court held that state and its other uh, institutions are actually trustees. They are maintaining natural resources on behalf of us, on behalf of public. Then polluters pay principles. Uh, are you aware of what is polluter pay principle? So this also, this particular principle was also. Uh, kind of given by the court courts of India and then absolute uh, liability principle that means there are certain inherent dangerous industries like dams and gas leakages so in that there has to have a compensate inbuilt when you design such projects okay whenever you're planning such kind of uh, projects you need to have a compensation inbuilt in those designing aspects um, next, I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to give you a timeline how solid waste uh, management, the policy and regulatory framework, how it has evolved over the period of time. So, um, very first committee that was there on urban waste was in 1970s. So, you can understand that 1970s was a very crucial period when a lot of environmental related, you know, committees, legislations, and a lot of institutions were kind of made up by uh, government of India. So one of the earliest known committee on solid waste was uh, by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in 1972. Till that time, sanitation, public health, water supply, solid waste were part of Ministry of Health. It was only after 1970s that the sanitation moved <coughs> and water supply moved to Ministry of, uh, that time it used to be known as Ministry of uh, Works and uh, Supply which will later become Ministry of Urban Development. So this shows that initially these concerns were part of, uh, these were understood as a basic services, social services, part of health and family welfare. They were connected to health. They were understood as that, they, that failure in these aspects can impact public health. Later on, it was become part, it became part of the urban development scenario. So then again, this followed a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, waste rules, 1989, first we had hazardous waste rule, 1990s, there was a committee and uh, due to the concerns of citizens on unsuitable practices in solid waste, there were a lot of PILs that were filed in 1996 from different parts of the country that led to Supreme Court deciding that we need to have a committee to understand what kind is, what is the status of municipal solid waste management in class 1 cities. That led to formation of rules 2000 on solid waste management. And these rules actually place responsibility, ultimate responsibility on ULBs. Uh, 
so this I don't have to go through. These are the regulations, legislations which are under the uh, solid waste management. At municipal level, municipality can form building bylaws. As I said yesterday, the town planning department can form building bylaws, uh, and to uh, and municipality also. And there are these policies that comes under uh, under which uh, solid waste is there. 